warmest greetings to my fellow Ross reservists. It's a real delight for me to know that I'm to be back in the old place again, if only indirectly. In one way, my departmental friends at Purdue are making it very difficult for me in that there's just no use in my trying to be modest after being named a founder and having a highly special ecology lab given one's name. My only consolation is found in the words of that philosopher of pro baseball, the immortal Dizzy Dean, said Dizzy, quote, it ain't bragging if you really done it, unquote. It ain't bragging if you really done it. I must admit that the idea of a Ross Biological Reserve was really one of the very best new ideas that alighted on me during the 92 years of my ontogeny. I thank Lewis Sherman, Kerry Ravenwold, and all the others, including thanks for choosing the interesting biological nomenclature for the new building. May it never, unlike so many new species, become split or lumped away. Purdue and our department have come quite a way in the last 50 years. The hugest, grandest barn anywhere graced the south edge of the campus, justifying the jibe that we were at Cal College. The university's emphasis was on undergraduate teaching in ag and engineering, clearly differentiating us from Indiana University. The then termed biology department was housed entirely in part of Stanley Coulter Hall on the north end of the Oval and in the late greenhouse just north of that building. The families of new Purdue professors usually rented one of the many crowded two-story boxy tar paper shacks called the Black and Whites, where the grad student courts later supplanted them. On cold nights, the water froze on the floors of the shower stalls. The Kofflers and the Lindsays occupied two nearby black and whites for one to three years. Most of our early Ross Reserve using students were back from World War II, helped by the GI Bill. These people were mature, and they meant business. Those were the glory years for the professing vocation. The next revolution in our department resulted from Henry Koffler being advanced to the headship. No longer was there just two ecology professors in their department, in the department. Koffler expanded and modernized the department and like John Carling before him and Bush Sherman after him, supported the Ross Reserve solidly. Surely the very least noticed event of the period was the founding of the Ross Reserve in 1949. Fortunately, the Reserve has since lost that distinction, gradually changing to a valued resource deeply affecting many. I congratulate those faculty members and students responsible for that reversal and for their spectacular success to this day. Of basic importance was simply to hang on to and guard the tract. Its protection, also proving vital, was the extension of the reserve's boundaries, facilitating its utilization by scientifically imaginative faculty and student researchers and learners. My hard hat is off to you for all your superb accomplishments. Turning to look ahead, whether actual users or practical supporters, let's help assure a good start on the second half century of the Ross Reserve.